we have an incredible panel of speakers who will come and speak and show the exact same things that my sister Colleen Echohawk is doing in the city of Seattle, except for they're doing it in a multitude of other places. And I am very blessed to be able to start this panel off and to bring up our very first speaker, who is my dear friend and loved one, um, Valerie Seagrest, who's going to come up and share with us. Valerie is... Um, living in the same area. She serves her community, the Muckleshoot community. Whenever I think of Val, I also think about um, what I see on her Facebook and what I know about her, and to see her and her little girls go out and gather all the time. It makes me so happy as I see those traditions that she has revitalized in her own family and community and see her passing those on to her next little ones. She serves as the coordinator of the Muckleshoot Food Sovereignty Project, and she works as a director of curriculum and instruction. But most of all, she is just a kind, compassionate, loving human being who I'm very blessed to call a friend. Good morning. Um, I have such amazing comrades like Sean, who <laughs> likes to come up and help me out in all technical issues. I'm always ha I'm, I have a technology curse. What did I tell that guy? Here I am. Um, <laughs> it's really funny. Um, so. I want to thank Abby for um, trying to make us cry over and over and over again this morning, first of all. And um, while we're waiting, I've just got, I so badly wanted to tell a story as well um, as she was, you know, sharing that really beautiful story about her sister Colleen, who's also a really good friend of mine. And it's true, you know, all the things she has to say about her are really true. She's one of those people that um, I get just like a random text message saying, I love you. You know, we all need more of that in our life. And Chief Seattle Club is also very near and dear to my heart and my family's heart. Um, I guess the, you know, as a Muckleshoot tribal member who works uh, within my community, it's kind of a bigger story to tell about um, doing the work that I do and why I do it. And it all starts with Chief Seattle Club, to be quite honest. Um, so my mother was a confidential adoptee, and we did not know for a long time where we were from. Um, and so when she... Uh, there we go. When she finished her career working for the United States Navy, um, she retired and we moved back to Seattle, Washington. And she took a job working for the Chief Seattle Club at that time and was the admin person at the front desk there. And uh, up until that time, she knew her, who her mother and father's names were, but didn't know much else about um, who we are and where we were from. And so she typed in her father's name and it came right up. He was a Chief Seattle Club member and lived just a couple blocks away from where, go to Prezi Classic, um, from where we were, the Chief Seattle Club offices were at the time. And there it is right there. Present. And so anyways, she calls me and is like, I'm at my father's doorstep. And I thought, you're losing your mind because grandpa passed away a couple years ago. <laughs> and uh, she said, no, I looked up my dad and his, he is living here just a couple blocks away from where my offices are in downtown Seattle. And so she ended up um, connecting with him. The first thing he said was, you know, I've been trying to get in contact with you all these years. I've been mailing you letters to Muckleshoot because that's where you're from. And um, up until then, we hadn't known. And so she called Muggleshoe, and Carrie Marquez answered the phone and said, we have all these letters from your father. And we were enrolled in Muggleshoe within the month. And it was this whole life change. And we had uh, him in our life for a year, almost to the day, one year. He was passing away from complications of liver disease, and I spent my year taking him to doctor's appointments and would get this sort of full picture of health, how people were treated when they were in um, doctor's offices for those brief 30 seconds, <laughs> how 
Um, they were treated by social workers and what their true uh, life looked like in their homes, how they ate, um, the whole system, thank you very much, and how complicated it really was for us to navigate. And so he would spend that time, he's actually a Cinnaboyne Sioux from Harlem, Montana, and he would spend that time with me talking about how much he loved that I drove really fast. <laughs> So that's cool, but also um, that you know he really believed that our um, our foods and our medicines were things that he needed to get back to, and he put up with me, you know, taking him to naturopathic doctors' appointments and trying to find all these other um, ways in which he could heal. And at the time, I would call my mom daily and, and say things like, why can't you just be like all my other friends who are just telling their kids what to do with their lives, you know, like be a dentist or be a doctor or whatever. Um, and I, I felt like that experience is what led me to, to the pathway that I chose, which was to quit school as a business person. I was studying business and creative writing. I mean, that's how, you know, curious I am, I guess. And, um, and start looking at nutrition. And I got accepted into a naturopathic um, physician university called Bastier University, which is sort of in the shadows of the University of Washington at the north end of Lake Washington. And uh, went to school for nutrition with the intention to become a naturopathic doctor. But that last quarter of school, I was taking a class called Therapeutic Whole Foods, and I walked in, and my teacher had a cup of tea waiting for us, and she told all of us geeky nutrition students to just sit down and be quiet and drink that cup of tea and connect to how it was making us feel. And, um, and for me, I was eating this like organic, vegetarian, crazy, uh, pristine nutrition diet and constantly sick and constantly stressed out because scientific degrees are stressful. <laughs> and, um, and I remember taking a cup, uh, a drink of that, that tea and feeling this like root coming right out of my body and rooting me right into the ground and this return back to this place of wellness. Like the strength was growing inside of me. And I um, learned that day that, that that tea was nettle tea and I therefore became um, a crazy advocate for nettle tea and all things nettle. For a while, my, my uh, nickname was Nettle Girl because I would walk around with these like jars of mason jars of like moonshine of green water. And anybody who'd ask me about nettle, I'd be like, or what I was drinking, I would tell them all about nettle and how it was gonna save the world. And I would, you know, stalk it and draw it and sting myself with it and bathe in it and eat it. And, um, <laughs> and so, you know, what ended up happening was I started talking with just random people about it and ended up getting my first job working for Northwest Indian College as a traditional foods and, me uh, traditional foods and medicines program, um, one of the coordinators. And that, I just sort of got off on this wild food parade and never returned back to medical school, but that's okay because um, as some of my mentors say, you went and got your Indian PhD and that's, what, that's all that matters. So, um, Anyways, I'm so grateful for that club that does way more than just serve, you know, homeless native people in the city of Seattle. It lights a fire inside of people and, um, and brings me to places like this. And so there, the little bit of work that you do, there are so many implications of how it can show up in the world and how it manifests. And so we should all be a little bit more kind to ourselves about what we're trying to accomplish, what we are currently doing. Even if it seems little and we have this huge vision, this is our time to do it. And as long as we're moving in that direction, cut yourself some slack because we're doing good work. And the work that we're doing, we're not gonna you know, be able to always see the benefits of it in this lifetime, and that's okay. That's dreaming big, and that's okay. That's a good place to be. So, thank you. Um, the sous chef has many talents. <laughs> One of them is being my IT person. This is not the first time this has happened, <laughs> to be honest. Um, 
So my name is Valerie Segrist. I'm a Muckleshoot tribal member. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in nutrition, and uh, my master's degree is, in, is focused on food systems of the Pacific Northwest, but it's um, in environment and community, a master's degree. And I wanted to start by talking about, well, one of the first um, teachings that you get practicing traditional medicine or even naturopathic medicine is the, the intention of treating the root cause of the problem. Right? And so for those of you who are trying to build strategies and uh, getting more urban native people to have uh, access to traditional foods and medicines, it's really good to kind of like geek out for a second. Don't worry, I did all that work for you. <laughs> um, and I'm writing this from the perspective of the Northwest. So for Seattle, this is what the time of change looked like. And for 14,000 years, um, and if you ask any Muckleshoot person or Coast Salish person, will tell you since time began, since time immemorial, our, um, the Pacific Northwest was the largest, most densely populated non-agricultural food system region in the world. That means that we managed our natural resources very, very well. It means we managed our fisheries very well. And that the first form of literacy that children would receive was how to read the landscape for the purposes of harvesting, hunting, fishing, right? To go out and be able to see a prairie and what that story is telling you and how the prairie's just simple existence without a spoken word has these incredibly vast teachings for us and how we can show up in the world and how we're supposed to carry ourselves. And that's what our children learned. There was no age segregation. There was no um, sitting inside of a classroom staring at a, a blackboard, uh, reading black on white. Uh, it was about reading the landscape and reading people. And so this photo is actually taken in 1898 in, on the shores of Seattle. Um, this is what I, I like to look at it because it reminds me of what Seattle was like not that long ago. It's not that long ago. But in 1792, when Captain Vancouver arrived, he's writing in his journals about witnessing these deserted villages and that there were signs of smallpox, tuberculosis, influenza, these pandemics that had swept through the land. We estimate somewhere between 1770 and 1830 these um, pandemics ravaged the uh, Northwest communities. What he might have also been looking at is people who had left their fishing village for a hunting village at that time. <laughs> so, you know, people did move in between village sites. However, it is true, uh, an estimated 80% uh, of the population did decrease. And that is, ne that is um, compared to entire libraries basically being wiped out, right? Certain longhouses had certain knowledge around how to utilize that alder bark for this particular purpose, and then you'd go to the next one, and they may use alder bark for a completely different purpose, but that was their knowledge. And in our teachings, our knowledge is our wealth, and in our teachings, you don't teach everybody all the same thing because we wouldn't meet each other and the world would fall apart. So you would honor that knowledge that that family carried. And when that, those very fast-moving viruses swept through those longhouses, it wiped people out pretty quickly. That knowledge fell away and, um, and some would say it was lost forever, but I don't quite subscribe to that. So after that, we have Hudson's Bay Trading Company moving in right away. The Do Donation Land Claims Act, which gave millions of acres in the Pacific Northwest to settlers in our region. This was before Washington was actually even a state, so it was kind of the strategy of the government to colonize the area so that they could make it a part of the United States. And then out of that came the treaties of the Puget Sound, which if you can even, I read those things and think, you know, Yes, they're, they're sad, and to this day, they're still the most powerful piece of environmental legislation that our lands have ever seen. They're going to be what we pivot on to make uh, important change happen uh, in the future here that needs to happen really quickly around climate change and land management acts. But um, just reading some of the testimony of what was given at that time when all of our leaders were meeting to sign those treaties, you know, their priority was about access to food. 
all the food, all the medicine, all the trees, all the bark, um, because they knew, and this is also in our creation stories, that when we're not eating those foods, when, when those things cease to exist, so do we as a people, that our identity leaves us when our, when our foods leave us. That we may move and breathe on this land and still be human beings, but that we're nobody without our foods. And so, um, just as they understood that people needed sheep and cow and cattle to um, live on those lands, we also needed access to our elk and our salmon and our clams and our ducks. And so um, that was part of that understanding. Out of that came the Indian boarding schools. And during that time, uh, what was being developed out of army rations was also being put into those boarding schools. So people's taste buds, prefer their preferences changed. They were altered during a time of extreme trauma. If you think about um, how trauma goes through generations, through hormonal imbalances, and in particular cortisol, our fight or flight hormone, that high level of cortisol being passed on to the next generation and the next generation and altering our taste buds. Um, that's what's going on here. People uh, earn the, well, were recognized as citizens in 1924, or our people, and ha that gave us the um, right to vote. But I've even to this day, you know, we know that there are issues with that in our communities. And then the FDIPA program, which rose out of what was happening in uh, boarding schools, enters our, our historical timeline here. But in the 1950s came the first documented case of diabetes for Coast Salish communities. That is not that long ago. And, um, and then out of that, became, you know, there were fish wars in the Pacific Northwest that um, is referenced as the Bolt decision. My, these are not things that happened like several generations ago. My in-laws and my um, partner were part of that. They're, um, my, my partner, Louie, talks about how he's a fisherman and how when he was two or three years old, he remembers being his parents getting shot at in the waters off of Seattle in Elliott Bay. So um, this has been a, a very recent history for us. But it's also this time when we can really, we have the power to change that. You know, f I look at this and I see inspiration because people are resilient, very, very resilient. That it is a miracle, knowing what I know about pandemics and how they work in the body, it is a miracle that we're here. And when I ask my elders, why, how did we survive that? Um, it's about the traditional foods and medicines that people were consuming at that time, that we had those, uh, that, deep, 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 rich nutrient blood content, and that that is what pushed us through and built our immune systems so that we could move past it. So I look at all that, and then in my geeky nutrition way, I look at the current nutrient guidelines for Americans. And, um, you know, we do a really good job, nutritionists, and sometimes I'm like scared to tell people I'm a nutritionist because they don't order the same things they would on the menu when I'm eating with them. So I sometimes have to like eat a lot of butter in front of people and you know, sometimes eat some fried food so they feel better about it. Um, <laughs> but but uh, what we're really good at is vilifying the macronutrients, the protein, the carbohydrate, and the fat. Right, and we focus a lot on that. And as a result, the standard American diet has a tremendous amount of energy and, ver and calorie content and very, very, very low nutrient content, which is sort of the exact opposite of what traditional foods offer us. And so if you look at, and this is like a really super geeky, I know, I know, there's numbers and words and it's like against my rule of showing beautiful pictures. But anyways, uh, so if we look at just vitamin C alone, the current US intake is at 74.4 milligrams. This came out of an NHANE study out of the Oregon State University just a couple years ago. Um, the nutrient guidelines set by the American Dietetics Association, the USDA, this is what they're, they're referencing. All of our um, 
food packages and things off of is at 65 to 90 milligrams. So the average American is getting 96% of what they're supposed to be getting on a daily basis when it comes to vitamin C. However, if you compare that to what the Coast Salish ancestors were eating, they're only getting 12.3%. And this is really important. I'm going to go geek out a little bit more on vitamin C. Look at calcium. There are certain things here that really catch me. So it is very well known that, in, that our, um, our institutions are looking at how people are chronically malnourished, even at the low in comparison to our ancestors, the low guidelines that are, that are being set for people. Um, vitamins or calcium, we're getting only about 65%, but in comparison to what our ancestors were eating, we're only getting about 44%. Um, magnesium, the symptoms of magnesium deficiency are the exact same symptoms of, di of diabetes. So um, this is important to me. I geek out about it because I, uh, a lot of people come to me in my community around, you know, I'm pre I'm, I've got prediabetes, help, what do I do? And I usually, you know, can make up a tea with certain plants and things for them because that's uh, my field of study as well. But what I'm always, always, always treating is a blood deficiency, that people just don't have enough nutrients in their blood. That's it. They don't have enough calcium, magnesium, iron, zinc, fiber. Um, we're way off the scales when it comes to this. And so micronutrients are very, very, very important. And I feel like we look over them quite frequently. So I love that they, are, they remind us that we're human. They're called essential nutrients because it means that they're essential for us to live, which is our reminder as a human that we, we aren't as awesome as plants and animals are, we're very pitiful. We can't just take like harness energy from the sun and pull stuff from the soil and make calcium happen. Like we can't do that. We rely on plants to exist <laughs> and animals. Um, and that it's, it's part of what helps distribute energy properly in our body so that our, fu our system, systemic functions can work. Um, minerals are totally, derived from soil and water, and um, also help grow bone health and help balance the waters in our body as well, or balance our fluids. So if you're looking at a vitamin C deficiency, now these things, so we see a lot of health disparities, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, osteoporosis, obesity, these things are prevalent in our communities, and like I said, up until the 1950s didn't exist, right? Um, so when you have a vitamin C deficiency, you're, at a, you're predisposed to develop diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and there's a lot of uh, research right now on treating cancer effectively in conjunction with um, radiation and chemotherapy and vitamin C, or high levels of vitamin C in plants that are high in antioxidants. Um, Magnesium deficiency, muscle weakness, seizures, irregular heart rhythms, directly connected to the increased risk of diabetes and high blood pressure. There we are again. Calcium deficiencies. Um, we have lots of dental issues. I just, I was sitting on my tribe's health commission and um, it's really amazing to me what we're dealing with when it comes to uh, oral health, uh, eye health, brain function. Um, a lot of these, uh, depression, uh, risky behaviors, whatever they want to call it, you know, that all stems from the medicine that uh, we get from micronutrients like vitamin C. Vitamin C is necessary for building neurotransmitters in our brain. Like, we actually have to have that as a foundation. Um, and then zinc. So here's the fun part, the remedy. The remedy is our foods. Huckleberries, or any berry really, incredibly high in minerals, specifically in the Northwest, vitamin C, antioxidants, and fiber. Um, in comparison to other, you know, its cousin, its close cousin, the blueberry, it's off the charts. Um, chili peppers, or even peppers, high in vitamin C. They also have a really important function in the body that helps boost metabolism and boost our immune system and bring strength. 
rose hips, just three rose hips have the same amount of vitamin C as an entire orange does, and they also have iron in them, which you need vitamin C to absorb the iron. They're high in potassium and phosphorus. They're considered blood cleansers in a lot of cultures. Seeds, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, we see this a lot, they're really high in minerals. Um, maple syrup, people are always so sad that they have to give up sugar. But maple syrup is a really great alternative, and you know what, it has all the things, all of the things that we need at high levels. And this is not just stuff I'm making up, you just simply go to the USDA database and type in foods highest in potassium, and all of our native foods come up. So it's really like everyone else is getting this information. Um, oysters. Uh, Dana did not believe me when I told her I could eat a gross amount of oysters. Three dozen later, no, <laughs> they're like, we're done. We've got to go now. Uh, these things are packed full of zinc and shellfish in particular, like um, Calcium, iron, magnesium, just like three clams have the same amount of iron as an entire piece of steak does. So there we have it. We have that like you can choose stuffed and starved situation or a really well uh, nourished low calorie count. You're talking three clams, you're talking less than 50 calories and you're getting all of the minerals that you need and feeling really full and good when you eat it. Beans. Corn, squash, beans, um, salmon, really high in, of course, all the healthy fats, but the micronutrients in salmon are really crucial as well. Really high in calcium, magnesium, uh, iron as well. Chia seeds, yes, the thing that grows the hair on that little weird doll thing. These are those guys. They're really simple, really easy to grow and procure. Um, in our area, we eat a lot of dug fir tips. They're high in vitamin C and electrolytes. We call them nature's Gatorade, except they don't have flame retardants in them, so that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then squash, of course. I love the, the, that rooted energy of squash. It's just like it, it is there to bring strength to your body. Um, and it's also incredibly high in vitamins and minerals as well. So these are all things that, like I said, if you go to the USDA database, these are the foods that come up, right? And they're not like some, from some far off land, you don't have to climb Mount Everest to get to them, they're not that difficult. These are things that you can just order more of or are really enthusiastic to grow in a small space as well. They're pretty easy to access. Um, this, is a series, it's uh, Feeding Seven Generations is, came out of a conversation I had with an elder from Tulalip, his name is Hank Gobin, and right out of nutrition, uh, studying nutrition, I went and sat with him and was like, I know what we need. We have to eat all of our traditional foods, everything's gonna be good. And then Hank looked at me like I was a child in his really awesome way and said, um, my girl, that's great and I want you to do that and remember where people are at, that nowadays our traditional and custom harvesting grounds are Safeway and QFC and Albertsons, and so how do we navigate those aisles and bring our ancestors with you? How are you gonna help people still be able to navigate both of these worlds? And so um, during that time, my colleague Elise Crone and I were, were going around the Puget Sound interviewing people around native foods and their access to native fo foods and we kept hearing these same principles and themes come out of that and emerge out of that. And so we started to um, collect them as the traditional food principles, or now we call it the Feeding Seven Generations. And this poster is available at chatwinbooks.com if you want to order it. it. It just covers the cost of printing and selling and um, sending it to you, so it's really affordable. But living with the seasons, right? that when people are in tuned with the seasons, they're in tuned, they, they experience attunement in their life. And that the beauty of it is what's available to you in the season is what's gonna get you through that seasonal change. So if you think about in our area, huckleberries are coming out. Um, right now it's all about, well, hopefully, I don't know, it's been raining, so they're all, all probably falling off the bush at home. But, um, 
but they're high in vitamin C and antioxidants, and that's what's going to boost our immune system to get us through that flu season. In the early spring, nettles emerge from the spring floor, and when we eat them, they're high in calcium, iron, magnesium, phosphorus. They build our blood and detoxify our liver and kidneys and help us build strength so that we can you know, accomplish all the goals we've been dreaming about in the winter seasons. That, um, that's there to help us wake up and get busy. So living with the seasons helps you get attuned with your environment. So eat the seasonal foods, right? Diversify your diet. The standard American diet is anywhere between 12 to 18 different foods that are eaten. We're given the illusion of diversity when we go to the grocery store and are inundated with thousands of options, when it's all really like corn and soy and now pea protein, I'm seeing that everywhere. So our ancestors in the Pacific Northwest, we have a database of over 300 different kinds of foods that were eaten pre-contact. And that's in some places just 50 miles from white cap to white cap, this incredible diversity that was growing through several different ecosystems. So eat more foods. Limiting our consumption uh, also helps us, you know, uh, it perpetuates the idea of buying into something that is producing a monocrop society and is not necessarily food secure or food sustainable. Eat more plants. The one thing all nutritionists can agree on, eat more plants, right? Um, they're obviously higher in um, minerals and vitamins. That's where you're going to get all your micronutrients from. And uh, my mentors tell me that the plants are our greatest teachers and they're just waiting for you right outside the door. You just have to go spend time with them and use your human superpower to be able to identify what it is. I mean, I'm really good at seeing Starbucks logos from like miles away, but if I use that, I can also see plants from miles away. It's amazing. <laughs> Traditional foods are whole foods. Um, you know, I don't know of any like fields of marshmallows or shrubs of Lucky Charms or rivers of diet soda, those things just don't exist in nature, right? So it takes like all of the mystery out of having to have a scientific degree to be able to shop for your groceries. You just go there and you see a blueberry is a blueberry. It's a blueberry. It's one ingredient. It's itself. And when we're eating whole foods, we feed that innate desire inside of us to feel wholeness, to feel connected to a bigger society and bigger things. Um, to gather wild foods whenever possible. We also, you know, want to plug in here like organic or free range. All those things fall under this. Uh, when foods are growing in their most natural free form, they're, they tend to be way higher in nutrients. So if I am harvesting, I try to look for plants that are in diverse systems that have to stand up to the weather and changing conditions because they have to have all that medicine in them to be able to stand up to that. And that's what I'm asking for as well when I'm talking to the plant harvesting and thinking about the people that I'm harvesting it for. To cook and eat with good intention. So um, I'm sure you've all seen this. Uh, I've been working sometimes in kitchens where we're trying to serve a thousand people and someone throws a fit and they're just like booted right out the door. Like, bye, we don't need that in our kitchen. Um, because, and I'm, I'm actually guilty of it too. I've spent some time, you know, cooking my vegetable soups, listening to Democracy Now, just angrily stirring my soup and then serving it up to people. Like, that's not good. So it, it's a good reminder that when we're cooking, we've got to um, hold really good intention because one of the most holiest things you can do is offer someone something to eat. You know, when they're a stranger in your home or they feel sick, that you, when, you, when you're trying to create a good relationship and be a good human being, you offer them food and you want to offer them the best. But also eating it with good intention is important too. If you're eating that macaroni salad thinking, this is gonna make me so fat, I might as well pitch a tent on my thighs and have a camp out there all summer, like that's not gonna help your situation, <laughs> right? Or even if you're driving down the road, eating food from one meeting to the next, your body doesn't differentiate between, you know, um, a gorilla chasing you through the jungle and someone slamming on their brakes in front of you while you're driving down the road. That cortisol hormone, that fight or flight hormone, 
gets really high in your body and all of a sudden your blood shunts away from the center of your body into your arms and legs so that you can run for your life. And that's not how we should be, our body should be reacting when we're eating. So it's really good to sit, take the time, taste your food, think about how it's making you feel, check in with your body, get connected. Um, that's what's gonna move you into that rest and digest phase. And then also giving back to the land and how important it is in everything that we do to make sure that we're honoring that food. So if I'm making medicine and I have some seed shrapnel left over, I go outside and put it underneath my favorite tree. But how do we do this in urban settings? It's not that difficult, to be honest. Um, building partnerships is really important. Just because in our situation, Seattle, um, our, our village sites for Muckleshoot are uh, Pioneer Square. They're <laughs> like Zizalalj. It used to be a duck snare site that my family um, descends from. And we could use help, you know, strengthening our food system and building a whole infrastructure that would help support each other. And Colleen is a great example of that. She totally understands. Um, how important it is to strengthen that relationship. So for her and her organization, they purchase all their salmon from Muckleshoot Seafood Products. That's me and my family out there harvesting those fish at, right out of Elliott Bay. So how do you create relationships with local tribes and what they are offering and bring that into urban settings? Um, but also to collaborate with city parks and recreation programs. We're in a really interesting space where parks and rec and conservation societies are kind of seeing that People, this whole idea that every time man steps into nature, we wreck everything around us is actually not, not true. That we prune these, these wild gardens, that we harvest and um, maintain and take care of them, and that when we harvest these things, we're also giving back and perpetuating growth. And so there might be some really interesting partnerships that you can develop with Parks and Rec. Um, and then really simply put them on the table, right? Like make it your mission. If you're going to a meeting, if you're going to a potluck, if you aren't invited to those places, make your own space, make that happen. And put just one traditional food on the table or tea. But um, we know that just one meal that includes a traditional food uh, in the week will increase your blood nutrient content. So you don't have to have like a full on immersed diet, just offering one thing is a start, and it's a good place to be. Uh, and then also talk with your local kitchen programs that manage menus. So in Muckleshoot, we've done a lot of this, but um, just simplifying it. So our elders program, for example, offers a traditional food once per week, right? Every Friday, people know they can go there and get clams or salmon or whatever it is that they're putting on the table. Our uh, tribal school does the same thing every Thursday. So it's just like one thing on the menu once a week. They're also inspired by wholesome and fresh ingredients. Um, our cooks talked about how they didn't feel like they were actually cooking if they weren't um, actually doing something with the food, like unwrapping it and sticking it in an oven is just not cooking. And so they wanted to take a home style cooking approach in everything that they were offering out of their menus. Um, but then also whenever possible, choose the highest quality ingredient. And what we know about food distributors like Cisco and FSA and all those folks, if we can collectively purchase our foods, we actually get into higher categories of being able to get different um, options that are more organic and have less MSG or whatever it is that's freaking your community out at the time. <laughs> um, and then to support community food producers and programs like Colleen does. So right now, actually, Muckleshoot fishermen are on their way to donate to Chief Seattle Club and several um, banks uh, just donate fish that we just caught the last two days. So we're creating that relationship with local tribes they, in turn, are also supporting our fishermen that um, also desperately need it as well. So um, I guess my overall message to, to you around you know, how to build up these strategies is also to shift, redesign our narrative around it. We are living in a time where everywhere we turn, they want to know what we don't have so that we can get the grant funding or the next, you know, big uh, 
prize nugget out there, but we, by taking a strength-based approach to everything that we do, we're gonna be able to really change the story. And if what you're doing is, seems really small, it's something, and that's important, and it's worth it, and so are all of you. So thank you very much. Getting the like hook, so I'm gonna go.